Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Amplify Your Business. Today, we have a special guest with me. So it's Matthew Pollard. If you don't know Matthew, this guy has done it all. I'm serious. I don't know where he finds the time to do everything that I'm going to be talking about here briefly in his bio. But I just want to say, hi, Matthew. Welcome to the show. And I'm going to get into your bio, okay? Thank you, mate. I'm ecstatic to be here. Okay. So you are joining me because you are the author of the Introvert's Edge book series, which I'm sure we're going to be getting into that a fair bit. And then you're actually going to be speaking at an event here in Edmonton on June 24th, or sorry, now I made a mistake there, on January 24th of uh, this coming new year. So it is for the BX organization, which is a networking organization that you are the ambassador for, right, in, across North America? That's correct. And I apologize about doing that to you. I think it was me that uh, said <laughs> June 1st, and I seem to have got it in your head. So yeah, on January 24th, we're doing this really great event in, in Edmonton. And it's actually myself and a, a good friend of mine, Mike McCullowitz. If, if you haven't read the book Profit First, uh, you should definitely absolutely check that out. But well, I mean, it's a great, you know, it's a great time to start looking at you know, how to make more profit in your business and of course, how to network because especially in today's economy, if we're not bringing new leads in, if we're not closing more deals, then really we're counting the days until, you know, we're shutting the doors of our business. So, you know, we really mm -hmm. want to make sure that A, we're focused on profit and B, we're focused on new customer acquisition. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a fantastic event. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on too. And there is going to be a link in the show notes so that people can register for that um, because it's a not to miss event here in Edmonton. Um, so let's get into your bio here. So uh, you are often called the rapid growth guy. Um, and uh, that's because you've been challenging businesses, uh, business owners to think differently and inspiring them also to transform their businesses. And you've been doing this with companies uh, around the globe, right? Everywhere. And it's been really cool uh, to dig into a little bit of your background. And so uh, I'm excited to have you talk about that, um, just a little bit more about your bio. So from having a learning disability, which I find just absolutely fascinating um, that you've overcome that, uh, it left you reading at a speed of a sixth grader, uh, it says here in your bio and in your late high school years. And uh, you were painfully introverted. It caused you to be quite introverted. And so that uh, also led to you being laid off in your first job just weeks before Christmas. And so they became then inspired, I guess, through all this diversity that life has basically laid at your feet. Um, so jumping ahead, though, a few short years, and uh, you were responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories of, of, uh, of your own. You transformed over 3,500 struggling businesses worldwide. You founded the Small Business Festival, uh, listed by Inc. as top among our top five business conferences in the nation. Um, you are an outspoken small business advocate, a rapid growth coach, international keynote speaker. Uh, you host as well two top-ranked podcasts, and you're the author of the best-selling The Introvert's Edge, uh, called A Game Changer by Neil Patel, praised as the real deal by Forbes. Um, you have been featured in Fortune, Inc., Entrepreneur, uh, CEO Magazine, and uh, you're a regular TV, radio, and podcast guest nationwide. And now you can add to your your portfolio of podcasts amplify your business so thank you so much for joining us today matthew mate look i'm as i said i'm ecstatic to be on i apologize for doing that to you i, I said you could go with the short bio and you're like no nope, i'm gonna read it all because people need to know <laughs> you know why why you're online but you know the truth is that you know i shouldn't i should be the last person teaching people how to create a rapid growth business and realistically it was the adversities in my life that seeded the success in my future and i know that's a big moral of, of your story is that of your show is really to help people realize that these adversities these struggles these barriers that we think we have they're actually our uniqueness our difference and our reason for why we succeed the problem is when we're looking to to confront them and a lot of them are false realities i can't do this because of this problem as opposed to how could i do this with these unique skills, these unique skills gaps, and how can I create success in my life? And funnily enough, when we look back on those, and you know, I, I don't know any successful entrepreneur that doesn't look back at the things that held them back or they perceive as holding them back and not say it was those adversities that seeded the success of my future. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very true, right? Like it is the uniqueness that we have. And this is the thing that I have found when I've talked to now we're almost around 200 entrepreneurs and the ones that seem to have faced the largest uh, challenges, they have developed the greatest resilience. And so they've actually found in some cases, I think more success than those who've maybe had a little bit easier run at things. And so it's really interesting to see how that can become such a huge advantage. And it's just a mind shift, uh, you know, that you have to make. Absolutely. I, th I think that one of the things that defines the difference between somebody that struggles to succeed and, and then succeeds and somebody that naturally obtain success, call it in high school, university, is that they don't develop the, the coping mechanism. You know, the people that mm. naturally succeed, they don't develop the coping mechanisms. I mean, for me, the world didn't work. So if I didn't find a way to succeed in a world that didn't work for me, I would never have been able to get any success. But also the way I uniquely work, look at the world has, has, has changed my, you know, the, my trajectory in life. And I, I think it's because a lot of people just say, you know, if we succeed in high school, we succeed in college or university, depending on what you want to call it. You know, when we succeed constantly and, and success just comes to us, we assume that if we follow the process, we'll get to a specific outcome. But over, over time, as we get to, to, to later in our life, we don't assume that there is a different way of looking at things. And that mm. is, a, is a real problem. For me, the, if I had have succeeded in, in you know, sorry, if, if school had have been any easier for me, maybe I wouldn't have looked at things the way I did. But for me, I used to always say, well, this won't work for me. So if there mm -hmm. was another way, what would it look like? And then I'd look at how I can lean into my natural skills. So even when you think about, you know, my books, the introvert's edge to sales, the introvert's edge to networking, absolutely things that introverts believe that they don't have natural gifts for, they don't have gift of gab, they absolutely know for fact that they cannot succeed, even though Zig Ziglar, the most well-known sales trainer on earth was an introvert, and Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group on earth is an introvert. We know for a fact we can't network and sell, we, even though we can't you know, you do small talk, even though Oprah Winfrey and David Letterman, two small talk uh, shows, obviously both of those are introverted as well, or I wouldn't be bringing them up, right? So what happens is we know for a fact that these things will are a limitation to our success, but what if they're not? And that's been my success by saying, well, hang on a second, what if there was another way? And what if my limitations actually gave me an advantage? What would that look like? And mm -hmm. then living in that world of what if, I mean, like Henry Ford says, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Well, if you think you can, then you start looking for a process or at least as an introvert learning to sell or an introvert learning to network or public speak or pick your so-called extroverted arena. I go out looking for processes because without those processes, I'm terrible at those behaviors with them. Just like anything else in business and life, a system will always outperform somebody winging things. Not originally, it takes a time to build a working system, but over time, they always outperform somebody winging things. And that includes winging things in sales and networking. Yeah. And I, and I love what you're saying there in terms of that you seeking out the processes, because I think that is probably the 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 magic the secret ingredient of your success because when i look at businesses the ones who have the best refined processes tend to have an advantage um you know comparatively speaking if you have two similar organizations one's really process driven and the other one isn't the one that's process driven seems to scale so much better and so you're able to to really leverage that and teach that i presume in the uh, trainings that you're doing with people eh? Well, absolutely. And I, I think the, the thing that people need to realize is that most people do, or anyone successful at business, believes the reason for their success is systemization. But funnily enough, even those people a lot of times believe you can't systemize sales, which is, which is mm -hmm. crazy. And this is not new stuff. Like Brian Tracy says, yep. the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. Well, of course, the top of that 80%, not the top 10, but the top of that 80%, are obviously extroverts because they're winging things successfully. The bottom of that 80% happen to be the introverts. But at the very top, introvert or extrovert, regardless, they're following planned presentations. So if you think about Jeb Blunt, Mark Hunter, Lee Sells, myself, and a plethora of others, 
They're all introverts that have sales systems. They're all on the global gurus list of top 30 sales professionals in the world. But also, so are people like Jeffrey Gittemore, who's mm. being, he's, he's an outly spoken extrovert, but says until he found systems, he had no idea how to train others. And if you're thinking yeah. about a successful business, do you want to say to your sales team, it's easy, just do this when half the group, because let's face it, more than just shy of 50% of the world's population is introverted. And they still join sales teams in the hope that they you know, can earn the money that salespeople do. It's not easy for them. So they can't just follow you. But if you say, follow this regimented system, you say this, if they say this, these are the processes you follow, everything changes. And you know, I, I discovered this by luck. So I, I don't wanna say to anyone, if you're an introvert, believing that you can't, that you know, this is totally your fault because I, I was extra special and I just realized this you know, out of the blue. That is not the case. For me, if it wasn't for a huge amount of bad luck, I would, and, and not having another option, I would never have got there. I mean, as you said, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I was super introverted. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And if it wasn't for getting diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which, you know, for the video uh, watches here, you know, basically I put on this funny pair of colored lenses and then miraculously I, I can learn to read. Now I can't learn to read like everyone else, but I can start the process of learning to read. Well. For me, you know, for the last two years of high school, it was it was tough. Like day after day, I really hustled and I got into the top 20% of my state. But because I'd worked so hard, I was literally in this position that I just didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And mm -hmm. my family knew that there's no way I'd stick it out at anything unless I knew what I wanted to do, because it took me a lot more work than the average person. Mm -hmm. So I really we all agreed I was going to take a year to find myself. And I took a job at a real estate agency. And before anyone thinks I wasn't the guy out selling, I was the guy in the back office, you know, look with a look on my face saying, I'm here to do data entry and find myself. Don't speak to me. <laughs> Yet literally it was like just a couple of weeks in and my boss pulls me aside. and He's like, man, I'm so sorry to tell you this. We just got a call from head office and it turns out they're closing down this premise. I mean, you're out of work and I worked there three weeks and in my mind, I'm like, well, what have I, there's nothing else I can do. I mean, you know, I've got nothing lined up in Australia. It's Christmas and summer at the same time. So we go on holidays on the 20th of December. We don't come back till the 15th or 20th of January. Who's hiring that's a business owner when you're about to take a month off? Nobody. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I, my dad broke his back 80 hours a week to support the family. He, he wasn't, we weren't from a rich family. There was no way I was going home to say I'm out of a job. So I pulled out the classifieds and I looked through the paper and literally there were three jobs that were on offer and they all said commission only sales. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay. Well, I applied for all three and I got three interviews and then I got three job offers. And I'm like, well, maybe they see something in me I don't see in myself. Well, I arrive at this job selling business to business telecommunications and my manager or well, my trainer at the time said, Matt, we just hire everybody. We've got this saying, we throw mud up against the wall and we see what sticks, which is yeah. a fun saying until you realize you're the mud. Yeah. <laughs> so here I am, five days product training, not a single second of sales training. I get thrown on this road called Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia. And literally, I had no idea even what to say. So I take a deep breath and I walk into the first door. And luckily enough, I was politely told to leave because shortly after that, I wasn't politely told to leave. Then I was sworn at. But my personal favorite was always getting told to go and get a real job. I mean, this was the only job I could get, right? So door after door, this kept happening until I got to my 93rd door where I made my first sale. And I remember I, I made about $70 and I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds. Because my next realization was I got to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next. And this is what brings me to the the success in life stems from the the, the, the the struggles that you have, right? The adversities that you face. Because for me, I had to take a step back and I could have said, I'm going to just, you know, work through this, which is a lot of um, what introverts, uh, sorry, introverts or extroverts do. And I love this hustle mentality in, in entrepreneurship, don't get me wrong, but not without a plan. So I could have continued to just hustle it out, or instead I could have given up, which is what 18 of the people in my 20 training group did. But instead I decided to say, what if there was another way? And if there was, what system would there be available to, to help me through that? And by deciding sales was a system, I went, well, I can't pick up a Zig Ziglar or a Brian Tracy book. It'll take me a year to read those, let alone apply them. But I then decided, what about YouTube? So I typed in sales system, and all these videos came up and literally every day I would spend eight hours out in the field applying what I learned. Then I'd come home and I'd spend eight hours practicing the next step or, for, or, or perfecting the step I was working on. Weekends I'd speak, spend 16 hours practicing. Now I'm sure this isn't sounding fun to anyone. It was not fun, but very quickly it was 78 doors, then 64 doors, then 31 doors, then 26, then 18, then nine, 
I got it down to selling on average every three doors. Now about six weeks in, my manager pulls me aside and I, th I thought I'd done something wrong. I'm like, here we go again, I'm about to get fired because he, he, he looked at me puzzled and I was the quiet yeah. guy that never spoke to anyone. I handed my paperwork in downstairs, I went upstairs, spoke to no one. He's like, Matt, we're kind of blown away by this, but we just got our national sales figures and you know, back then it was once a month you got the report. He said, you're the number one salesperson in the company. This was the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So to put that in perspective, terrified to sell, horrible at it, so the number one in the company in the space of six weeks. Unbelievable. Well, that's yeah. the trajectory. That's how long it takes. Now, of course, they said, oh, you can sell. Clearly, you can manage. Well, that wasn't true. I was like, I, I don't have a clue how to manage. They're like, mud up against the wall, see what sticks. 20 people given to me, 20 people quit. Back to YouTube, <laughs> learned how to manage, got pretty good at it. Well, just you know, about a year later, I started up my own business after being promoted seven times. And then fast forward just shy of a decade, yes, I've been responsible for, for five multi-million dollar success stories. But I think the most exciting thing for the introverts listening is I'd gone from terrified to sell to teaching hundreds how to do it. And, and now through, you know, the introverts edge, you know, I mean, the, the two books have sold over 75,000 copies that are in 16 languages. You know, I now get to show the world that not only can introverts survive in this so-called extroverted world, but they actually have the edge when it comes to sales and networking and all of those other so-called extroverted arenas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love it. And and this is a thing that you're connecting with that almost 50% of the population that really is fearful of what they perceive that limitation to be, right? And so you flip that that script around. And I just love that. Anytime that a person can flip the script on somebody, it's really exciting. Uh, and you must experience that when you're speaking, when you're talking, when you're coaching, when you're doing these trainings uh, with people, uh, when they start to understand it, right? Like there's that moment. Now, I, I'm curious, like what I read there in the bio, uh, one of the statements was just that you challenge biz businesses to think differently. Um, and so you're challenging individuals at this introvert's edge, uh, uh, you know, that level for sure at the individuals. But in terms of the businesses themselves, when you're going and you're working with entrepreneurs, when you're working with business owners, how do you challenge them to approach their businesses differently so that they can achieve the success where they can identify maybe some of those things that they're perceiving to be challenges, which are actually opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that what's really important when you think about a small business is, well, I love seeing an introverted small business owner with enough talent, skill and belief in themselves to go and start a business of their own. But what I find is more often than not, they're stuck in this endless hamster wheel, struggling to find interested people, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale. And they even believe that people care about only one thing, price, right? So the, the problem with that is that they feel like they're just constantly grinding it out. And this is their only way to succeed, which is why I'm on a mission to help, especially introverted service providers, because they're the ones that struggle with it most and the ones that identify most with my ideology because they're willing to do the work. And it's not to say it doesn't work for extroverts, but the thing is extroverts want to wing things and it takes a little bit more effort to get them to take a small step pack back to catapult forward. Where introverts mm. were like, well, we're terrible at this. So yeah, I'll take a small step back. It's actually still feels like a step forward. And then, you know, I'm going to do the work to get to this outcome. So I'm on a mission to help introverted service providers realize that they really can have a rapid growth business doing what they love, but not by getting better at their functional skill, because they're usually amazing at that. It's by focusing on three things outside the scope of their functional skill that allows them to build a business that revolves around them, their family and their life, not the other way around. And I, I think the best example of that would actually be a language coach out of, out of California. I mean, she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And look, I have to say that for somebody that um, in, in, in any industry that was commoditized, it would be language consulting, right? You've got people moving into, uh, into California that were willing to charge $30 to $40 an hour, while she'd successfully charged $50 to $80 an hour for a decade. Now, all of a sudden, she's losing current clients. She's struggling to get new clients. On top of that, there are people in China offering to do it for $12 an hour on Craigslist. Yeah. And uh, worse than that, there's now technology out of San Francisco. You know, you teach me Mandarin, I'll teach you English. We just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So she comes to me and she's like, can you give me some sales training to compete in this market? Now, sure, I could have given her sales training, but back to your point, that's not thinking differently. Sure, I could have showed her to close more deals, but what the key for her was to actually avoid the battle altogether. So what I did is I looked at all the clients that she worked with over the years and she'd worked with hundreds. But what I realized is that she worked with these two executives being relocated to China and she was helping them 
with far more than just language tuition. Now, she helped them understand the difference in rapport in China versus the Western world. Like here, if I was trying to sell you something and I was really bad at sales, at the end of 45 minutes, I might say something horrible like, hey, do you want to move forward? And you'd say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it, right? Well, yeah. next week, if I ask you again and you still say you want to think about it, my chances of getting that sale are shot. But in China, they're going to want to meet with you five or six times before they discuss business. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. It's just who they are because they're talking about 25 to 50 year deals, not transactional or 12 or 24 month relationships. So I was like, she helped them with that. She helped them understand the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world, the importance of respect, why learning the language wasn't enough. You have to reduce your accent, how to handle a business card, why it mattered so much in China. And I'm like, Wendy, stop. You're doing so much more for these people than just language tuition. What are you doing? Just like everybody listening, she was stuck in her functional skill. She's like, what do you mean? They're just a few things I'm just trying to help. Now we all do things above and beyond their functional skill for our customers. That's why they sing our praises. That's why they don't question when somebody else comes to us cheaper. That's what we struggle to articulate when we're first meeting someone. And I said, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance you're giving these people, they're gonna be more successful when they get to China? And she's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? I said, great, let's call you the China success coach then. Forget about Mandarin education for a second. We created this five week intensive that worked with the executive, the spouse and any children being re relocated across to China. Now she loved the idea of this, but she's like, well, who do I sell it to? What she's asking is who do I network with, right? Which is the next part of the equation. So what I said to her is I said, well, who do you think your ideal client is? She's like, well, obviously the executive. So what she wants to do is go in and sell to executives in that transactional sale which again, I think that networking, I'm tired of people going to networking events, just trying, do you want to buy from me? What about you? What about you? For the average person yeah. listening, you're probably doing what I call aimless networking because you're trying to avoid behaving like that. So you're having these shallow conversations where you walk out with business cards, but none you'd contact. You tell yourself, you know, if they contact me, I'll work with them, but they never do. So what I said to her is I said, yeah, that makes sense. But in truth, I mean, I was terrified moving from Australia to the United States. And I mean, here they speak the same language. So I, I can't even imagine going to China. I just don't think it's her ideal client. And she's like, well, obviously the company would pay. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I get it. They might have millions of dollars riding on the executive being successful. I still don't think it's your ideal client, I told her. And she's like, well, who then? And I said, I think it's the immigration attorney. And she's like, what? I said, think about it. There are all these people that charge five to $7,000 to do all the paperwork and all the bureaucracy that comes with getting a visa. They've got to get a client, which we all know isn't cheap. They've got to pay for office space. They've got to pay for staff. They'd be lucky to make $3,000 for every successful visa. I said, just yeah. go and network with those people and offer them $3,000 for a successful introduction. They loved it. They're like $3,000 for a simple introduction. What have I got to say? She said, just say, you've got your visa now. Congratulations. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to get relocated to China. They would say something like, yeah, I think we're good. We got our place sorted. We're learning the language. Kids are getting pretty good at it too. We got our visa now, thank you. I think we're set to go. And they just respond with, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. Now, when Wendy got on that phone call, she had the easiest sale in the world. They were recommended by their attorney. They were terrified to go and the organization was motivated to pay. She charged $30,000 for this. And after the $3,000 commission, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world. That surely beats <laughs> selling for $50 to $80 an hour in a commoditized market. That's what thinking different is. What you've got to yeah. look at is what are the unique things you do outside the scope of your functional skill? And then what is the high level benefit of that? For Wendy, the, fun, the, the rapport, respect and e-commerce, the higher level benefit of that was China success. For me, I'm a business coach, a branding expert, a social media strategist, a sales expert. I'm too many things. Nobody cares. And nobody cares how much anyone else knows either or how long they spend. But when you say I'm the rapid growth guy and I work exclusively with now my niche, introverted service providers, the simplicity of that message is get what gets me heard in a crowded marketplace. Then sales is easy. And that is what people need to start focusing on. These two steps make sales the easiest thing in the world. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great story. And, and I really appreciate the way that you've laid that out. And so one of the things that, that I am getting from you is you're a storyteller as well. Just an incredible storyteller. Is this something that you have, uh, you know, worked at trying to create that and you identified that as an opportunity? Or is this something that you've always been uh, or had that gift, I guess? 
Absolutely. So firstly, you're 100% right. And I'm, you know, I'm being flown to Dubai to teach a billion dollar company how to do storytelling um, in January. So, you know, I, I speak all over the world on storytelling for corporations, right? So I speak, you know, I actually talk about rapid growth for small business and I speak all over the world on that. But corporations get me in just to tell stories uh, or to teach storytelling. Why? Because storytelling has a couple of real key features and this is hugely important for introverts. By the way, for introverts, a story is, I worked with a customer, they wanted this so we gave it to them. It is not a list or a Rolodex of the case study evidence of, you know, we're just going through a series of dot points. Stories, when told well, short circuit the logical mind, you speak directly to the emotional mind. If you're wondering what the difference is, the logical mind is the part of the brain that said, that'll work for me, that won't work for me, I don't need that, I don't have time for this, hang up or go to the next podcast episode, right? But your emotional brain, when it hears a story, it literally yells out, story time, and it just listens. It assumes all the detail in the story is factual. So this comes with a duty of care. Do not sell a product that you do not believe in, right? Life is too short. But when you sell a product that you don't you believe in, then stories are a great way of speaking to the emotional mind, which is the buying center of the brain, and communicating to them in a way of this customer was just like you, and we got them to a great outcome we can do the same for you. So stories are really powerful for that. Also, especially for introverts, it activates the reticular activating system of the brain. And that is what actually causes us to create artificial rapport because our brains synchronize. The reticular activating systems of our brain synchronize and we feel like we have a stronger relationship than we actually do with that person. Now, science says that introverts are well known to create from shallow relationships, much deeper relationships than extroverts. We struggle to create that initial rapport, which story allows us to do. It's why when I get on these podcasts, you know, I can be a little shaky until we get into a story and then I'm like right there front and center. When I get on stage, I start with a story. I get right up and I start with a story and I feel the entire audience in my hand within seconds where otherwise they'd be, I'd, I'd be thinking they're sitting there going, who's this kid up on stage teaching me how to run my business that's 20 years younger than me? And then on top of that, people remember up to 22 times more information when in it into a story. Now think of the power of that. You could have seen 10 salespeople and the likelihood is you'll remember more of what I tell you than all 10 other people combined. Plus you'll walk out feeling like I have a better relationship with you than all of them combined. Stories are hugely powerful, yet most people don't use them in networking, in sales, in public speaking. And they, I mean, don't get me wrong, some of you think that you do, but just like the story of how you met your, your, your mother, uh, your, sorry, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your life partner, I'm talking about stories like that. You know, like the story I, when I, I first met my wife, is when we told that story, you know, it was kind of a little bit bulky. And, you know, uh, when I told it to people, we could see that, my wife and I. And we, you know, you, we, it was like we edited ourselves and we removed things that people didn't enjoy. And then we started to embellish on things people did enjoy. And now over time, become a bit of a theatrical masterpiece. And I think anyone that's been married for some time, <laughs> it's the same, right? I say certain things, she says certain things, we hold each other's hands, we look at each other, and we're like, so that's how we met. Right. That is how a story should be told in a business setting as well, because that's what keeps people engaged. Think I'm wrong. Well, go and watch the news for three minutes and see how bored you are versus going to watch a three hour movie. I mean, that is why the news is trying to be more entertainment now, because they are losing people. What you have to understand is story is by far the biggest driver of higher closure rates, shorter sales cycles. And if you're a corporation that's trying to hire new people, it drastically reduces the ability, the, the amount of time it takes to make them a profitable and stable member of your team. Because when you teach them how to tell a story, if they can learn one story and tell it well, then they look like they come across with 30 years of experience as opposed to trying to speak in jargon, which makes them, it forces them to hide behind email and sell behind email. So story is just the best tool for sales. So when I'm looking at people that are in sales teams, I suggest story is the number one step. When I'm talking to business owners, I say, no, let's get the message right, then let's niche down, then let's create packaging and pricing that's designed to stimulate purchasing behavior. And once we've done that, then let's create a story and use that as the primary source. And then you can build out the whole sales system. But if you just focus on that, I mean, I always tell people if they just focus on the sales system, which by the way, no one needs to hire me to do that, right? You can go to theintrovertsedge.com and literally download the first chapter of my book. There I'll convince you that you can sell as an introvert and I'll give you the full seven steps. If you do nothing more than grab what you currently say and put it into there, you'll realize there's some things out of order and you can fix that. You'll realize there's some things that don't fit and you shouldn't be saying those to customers. So don't figure out how to fit it in, throw it out. And then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, usually around us 
asking the right questions, not questions, the right questions and telling it great stories. And if you do that, you'll double your sales in 60 days. You throw a unified message in a strong niche, you'll have explosive growth. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. And I am so, um, I guess, uh, believing of story when it comes to to business. And so one of the things that we did in the early days of Ample Media, my uh, marketing company, is we started out creating explainer videos, and it was all about storytelling. So we'd have customers that would try to edit down the story, the script, uh, because they wanted it to you know, include more of the features and and so on within it. And and it just wasn't necessary because what we were trying to do was capture their attention through the story and relating to analogies and using metaphors and so on. It was just way, way more powerful than the scripts that would get whittled down into a feature benefit kind of set, right? And so, um, and that's just a compressed version of what you're talking about. So the power of story is massive. You know, it's, it's interesting you say that. So I see a lot of introverts that will prep a, you know, a three minute story to tell in networking events. And then they'll, it'll feel like five hours when they're telling it to somebody. So they'll, they'll quickly truncate it and they'll cut out all the emotional fabric of the story. And they will, they'll just tell mm. you the dot points, which is more like the features yep. of what the person got. And it butchers the entire experience. So if you're going to cut and butcher it, the features is what you want to drop out because people don't actually care about that. But what's really interesting is if you think about what I've done during this podcast, if you feel like I've given you value, and I, I hope that you do, what you've got to realize is that I could have given you a lot more theory, a lot more frameworks, and you would have remembered none of it. You would have applied none of it, and you would have been inspired and motivated, not at all. But you would have probably walked away going, I'm going to go all the way and apply all that. You just wouldn't have. Now, yeah. by telling you stories, you have seen in a tangible way how it applies to somebody in a unique case. So why you haven't got as much, you now understand why it's important and you have a want to apply it. And by the way, if you wanna create a unified message and discover a niche, again, you don't need to hire me for that. Go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. There you'll be able to download a five-step template that'll literally walk you through how to generate the unified message and create the niche. And you know, this is what I talk about because when you speak from stage, what you've got to do a lot of times from podcasts, you have to motivate people. You know, I sat down, you know, I did this, in a, it was a, a session with nearly 200 people in the room at the National Freelance Conference. And I did this worksheet. And at the end, I said, who here believes they have a unified message now, their version of the China success coach, the rapid growth guy that'll excite and inspire and motivate people to want to know more. Like 97% of the room put their hand up. I'm like, great, keep your hand up. If you believe you've identified a niche of people that are willing to pay you what you're worth. 97% of the room kept their hands up. I said, great, now keep your hands up if this is the most time you spent actively working on your marketing since you started your business. Now, actively, not reading more books or watching more videos or listening to podcasts, actually yeah. actively on this. 85% yeah. of the room kept their hands up. Yeah. So the key is, is this works if you spend the time doing it. So if you just go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth and download that template, this that whole session was only 90 minutes long. Yet, most people had never spent that amount of time. I recommend, and I'm sure you won't mind this, get somebody else to listen to this podcast as well. Get them to download the template and work through it with them. Spend about an hour on them, get them to spend about an hour on you, and your business will be transformatively different. Again, most people just don't do this stuff. Now, one recommendation, if you're a business coach, don't work with another business coach. Go work with a florist. I had a florist that doubled her business in literally 90 days by applying these exact strategies after that workshop. So don't think, oh, they're a florist, they're nothing like me. That's a benefit because they're not going to fall into your jargon. And if you're a florist, go and work with a graphic designer, not with another florist. Yeah, yeah, great advice and great resources. Now, one of the things that I always like to ask my guests um, is if they could go back in time or send a letter back to your younger self. So Matthew Pollard, you know, 20 years old, starting your first business or whatever age it was that you were starting to really go down your entrepreneurial journey. What would you include in that letter to yourself? I'm curious about that. See, one of the things that I find that introverts have, and it is our biggest problem, hurdle, and also our biggest advantage, positive, depending on how we utilize it, is reflection. So mm. introverts will go to a networking event, and they'll go back and they'll reflect on all the silly things they did or said or should have <laughs> said, and yeah. they beat themselves up over it. And yeah. this is our natural tendency. I mean, introverts are amazing at active listening. They're, they've got amazing empathy and reflection is a superpower of ours as well. And by the way, these are things that extroverts don't have, right? Some might say extroverts aren't the best listeners. They're not the most empathetic and they, they don't reflect on things, right? A lot of times they have to be told to do so. So now these are all things that can be coached and taught. Again, 
if a extrovert has the willing and want to act, a willingness and want to actually go and do that. But for an introvert, we reflect and we our negative self talk takes over and we beat ourselves up over these things. And when I was younger, that was I remember it. It was horrific. Now, because I look at everything as a system. What I do is I look at as my sales process, my networking process, which um, you know I, I I take out of myself. You know, it's an external process now. It's not like like Henry Ford we talked about before. It's not like when a car came off the line and it wasn't perfect. He was like, oh my gosh, I was never meant to build cars, or I'm a horrible person, right? So we look at sales and networking as an external process, and we then use our scientific brain, which again, introverts have by reflecting and saying, which one thing can I improve? Why? Because sales networking, it's like a science experiment. You change more than one thing at a time. You don't know what's blowing up in your face. But if we use our reflection in that positive way to look for something to change, as opposed to in a negative way of beating ourselves up over things that we should or shouldn't have done, all of a sudden it becomes this superpower in our lives because all of a sudden, we have this iterative con com um, continuous improvement approach yeah, yeah. as opposed to this negative spiral self-talk. And that just sends us on a totally new trajectory. If I could have given myself that note 15 years earlier, my gosh, if you think I had achieved stuff now, imagine what I could have done. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and that's that's such a great insight because I think that that is so true. I am naturally an introvert as well. And so I can relate to that, just beating yourself up over the smallest of little things that you think maybe you should have said differently or done differently uh, in those networking opportunities. And so, yeah, that's great advice. Well, thank you for that. And I mean, talking about network again, uh, so as the ambassador of BX, just give us a little bit of a snapshot as to what BX is and how that is different than maybe some other networking organizations that entrepreneurs have maybe experienced in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, first thing I'll say, I'm a big fan of networking, period. So yeah. if you're already a member of a, a networking organization, I'm not saying, hey, cancel that, come join this, because I believe that all versions of networking are incredibly helpful. And, you know, even though I find transactional networking uncomfortable, for those people that are desperate for a client right today, that might be something that you need to do. But what I realized is there were no real networking events that existed in this world that, um, or definitely in America at the time and, and Canada, that focused on different types of relationships. Because I believe that the real power of networking is not finding these transactional sales or customers, if you like, but actually building what I call momentum partners and champion relationships. Now, a momentum partner is somebody that believes in your passion and your mission and wants to share that with others. Very similar to Scott introducing me to you to share my work with you know the the the, the small business audience that listens to your uh, to your podcast, right? So people in this world that believe in your work and share it, and you do the same for them because you believe in theirs. If you can go to networking events and discover these relationships, you know, in in the foreword of my first book, there's a girl called Judy Robinette. She's known as one of the most networked people in the planet, and she came to me for one thing, and I could have helped her, I could have sold her that and made a little bit of money. But instead, I turned her into a momentum partner, and I can tell you, I probably made over half a million dollars through the introductions that she's made for me in the last several years. What if I had made a few thousand dollars? If I had have had the wrong mindset, so people are looking for an opportunity to turn it into a transactional relationship. I was looking for an opportunity to look for momentum partners and champions. Now, yeah. a momentum partner could be somebody like um, somebody that introduced you to podcasts, somebody that is working with a similar demographic as, as yours, because then you can introduce each other to your your ideal clients and you can see and serve each other because your your products are complementary for the same client and then you have what i call champion relationships now truthfully if you find a champion do whatever they ask if they say take out my dry cleaning go do that for them right these are the people that give you work credibility like ivan meisen the founder of bni has endorsed my book michael gerber the founder uh, the, the author of emus has endorsed my book these people give my work profound credibility and as a consequence it allows you to get other people to see you in a higher level are willing to pay you more and are willing to wait on waiting lists to get the opportunity to work with you or hire you. So the reason that these relationships are so important is if you've got a great unified message, your version of the China success coach, you know your niche and you've got a great sales system, the only things you're really missing is introductions and credibility. Well, those things, your champion relationships and your momentum partners will provide. And if you don't have either of those, you are going to find it harder to get your price up or you're going to find it harder to get introductions, which means that you need to 
go to more networking events. Now, the secret behind my networking book is it's about teaching you how to be a master in the networking room, so you never really have to go back to one unless you want to. Now, if you want to go back to a networking event, the whole idea is that you go for momentum partners in champion relationships, not transactional deals. Because today, if you've got the right message and you can market it correctly, you can get your ideal clients to chase you in the online world. Now, the reason why most people are taking photos of their dog and their donut is if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest. And that's why they work so hard online. But if you've got the right message, transactional relationships, sales relationships, clients, that's an online activity once you get past that survival mentality. So when you go to networking events, you have to look for momentum partners and champions. Now, what I wanted to do was create an event in America and, and Canada and the whole Northern Hemisphere that focused on those relationships and they really didn't exist. So what was funny is about that time I was speaking at an event in Australia and the founder of at that event came up to me and said, Matt, I just invent, um, invested in an organization that literally outside a couple of synonyms is exactly what you're looking to launch. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I introduce you? They've grown to a thousand members. And I was like, you know what? They are. So I picked up their working formula. I moved it to the US. We launched in Austin. It did really well there. We've launched into multiple cities in the US. And then because of my relationship with Scott, uh, who I know we both know well, Scott King, you know, he was like, can we bring this to Edmonton? And so we're, we're, we launched it in Edmonton and it's really taken off there as well. So I'm really excited about, you know, seeing a type of networking that really focuses on getting you out of that hamster wheel and developing the relationships that really mean a difference in the world. Yeah, excellent. Well, and for those who are listening, again, January 24th is when we're all going to be getting together actually in a theater and we're going to beam Matthew in as well as uh, as some other guest speakers too to talk to us as a group of entrepreneurs about some of the things that Matthew has been sharing here today already, but it's about improving your business and really looking at um, your business in a different way. Um, like Matthew was saying, like he challenges you to approach things very differently than what maybe you are already doing so in your businesses. So come join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Check the link in the show notes, like we said. And for those who are interested in some of the uh, free resources that Matthew has mentioned and so graciously graciously provided, head over to his website, which is uh, Matthew pollard.com and you're going to be able to access all the information and get his book as well if you happen to be an introvert this is a must-have there's a series there uh, that breaks down all aspects of basically what you're going to need to know to grow your business like you've never grown it before so thank you very much matthew i really appreciate you taking the time today to speak to us and our audience here it was my pleasure and you know congratulations for getting close to your 200 episodes for those people that are listening that have never launched a podcast you have no idea how much of a herculean effort that is so congratulations for for putting in the work and benefiting so many businesses for doing so oh, thank you so much i really appreciate it and for those of you who are listening today and you like this episode and want to learn more about some of the other entrepreneurial journeys and experts that we've had on the show then head over to amplifyyourbusiness.ca and you're going to be able to find our full archive there and of course if you're watching this and would prefer to have an audio only uh, version then uh, just head over to your favorite podcasting platform and search amplify your business you're going to find us there as well until next time everybody have a prosperous day and i look forward to hearing more from you matthew in uh, january 24th <laughs>